We are going. All right, so welcome everyone. To today is the third installment of the Introduction to the Basic Concepts of GIST. The first two may be found on our website and also on our YouTube channel. So what are we going to do? We're going to kind of go through an introduction to the basic ideas, some of the design goals, uh, and focus mostly on the most often used concepts and some common patterns. Now, we've, I'm probably going to skip over the introductory and design goals part because we've covered that in the previous two sessions. Um, so what is just more generally, it's an upper enterprise ontology with a minimum set of concepts required by most businesses. Some links here. And if you do use GIST, we ask that you use this particular attribution. Um, and so the purpose of this overview is so that you will understand what GIST is all about. You know how its overall structure has been arranged, what the key classes and properties are. And once you've studied just a little bit more and maybe reviewed the videos and done some other research, you'll be able to take your existing ontologies and map them to GIST. So in other words, when you have a class and you say, oh, what does this correspond to in GIST? And then you have enough information having seen these videos to go ahead and make that mapping. Uh, or maybe you're going to start from scratch and create an ontology. So you have a concept like um, contract. Or maybe you don't, maybe we don't have contract, but you say, well, what's a contract in GIST? Oh, there's agreement. That sounds about right. So I'll map it to agreement um, or identify or things like that. Um, and then you also have enough of a starting understanding to just go ahead and study things further on your own. That's really what this is all about. Okay, so the overall scope of GIST includes quite a lot of things. What is covered in green, sorry, what is colored in green are things that we already talked about in the last two sessions. So a lot about persons and organizations, physical things, actual stuff, oil, products, you know, transport vehicles, etc. Places, a whole bunch of interesting information about places. One of the key challenges with places is this notion of addresses which point to places, but they're not places. Um, and also the difference between a, an actual area, maybe a mountain range, which is a nebulous region, versus a region that's really defined by political boundaries. So that's an interesting question. And then something that's defined by political boundaries really means there's some governing entity who's in charge of what goes on in those boundaries and they, it's kind of called a jurisdiction. So there's a lot of interesting challenges around that. Events are very important. Things happen and you need to track them. <laughs> Some events happen over course of time. Um, as a few time related concepts, we talked a lot about addresses and identifiers, a little bit about intellectual property. There's not a lot to say there, but things like, you know, software applications, that's really intellectual property. Somebody owns that brands, things like that. It doesn't show up an awful lot, but it does show up from time to time. Uh, we're going to talk today about collections and categories. It's half green and half black because we got started mm -hmm. at the end of the last time, and we're just going to review that and continue. Intention is kind of a broad category under which all kinds of things are lumped, you know, specifications and commitments and offers and things like that. And then we talked about catalog items, which is things that are for sale. And we'll be talking a little bit today about products and services and have a little bit to say about templates. We covered uh, content media languages already. And again, today, the, the two other things we're going to cover, we're going into a little bit of detail on quantities, units, and meshes. It's a complicated idea. There's almost literally dozens. There's certainly a dozen or more ontologies out there to, to represent quantities, units, and measures. Ours one has been out there a long time. And we think it's as good or better than the rest, but we'll explain what it is and you can decide. And then there's a kind of a, a, a broad abstract class where we put things that we don't really know what else goes there. So like maybe a field in a database or a column or some kind of metadata structure we'll put in under that class. Okay, so with that, we're gonna jump into categories and collections. So this will be a little bit of review for those who were here at the end of last time. So what I've noticed over the years is, you know, you do, you just kind of, when you start modeling in OWL or any language, you start, especially let's just take OWL, for example, since that's what we use for just things get lumped into buckets in different ways. And I suddenly realized one day, gosh, you know, there's, there's actually rather distinct ways that you can think about putting things into buckets. And the most common way is to say, well, there's classes, and so we have top-level classes and just organization, person, 
agreements. So what is that? That's a, so agreement is a class and it's really a bucket into which everything that is that you call an agreement it goes into that bucket. Um, and so that's the most pervasive way to organize things into buckets in OWL. So you create a class and then you have instances of that class and you connect the instance to the class using the relationship RDF type. But there are other buckets, if you like, you know, into which groupings, ways to group things together. Um, so take the take a the concept of a jury or maybe a deck of cards, but let's just take a jury for the moment. So this is OJ Simpson's jury, three people who are a member of the jury. So there's 12 people on this jury. And here's the names of three of them, Carrie Best, Sheila Woods, and Lionel Clare. So what is this? It's an this is a collection. It's a group of things. Um, and it's an instance of something called jury. And jury, we have something in just called collection. So it's really for grouping together things that are related to each other and some for some reason you're putting them in the same bucket. It might be a committee whose job it is to, you know, put together a request for, for a, a new ontologist in your company. We need three people to put together this, this job spec. So that now becomes a little collection of people. And you might, if you wanted to model these kinds of collections and track what they're, what they're there for and what they're doing, you might use this. Now, just collection is itself an all class. This is one of the classes we created as part of GIST. So the idea here is you link, whereas in the case of the first kind of bucket, a class, you link the individual to the, to the bucket using RDF type. But in this case, it's a collection. So we use a different mechanism for linking the members of the grouping to the group. And we use, in fact, is member of. So think of this as a set, if you like. So it's a member to be a member of a collection. Now, there's another sense in which things are grouped into buckets. And this is really category. So what category of employee are you? Are you, you know, um, exempt or not exempt? It's just a category. Um, it's not a, you don't, I mean, you could model it as a class if you wanted to. You could say there's two subclasses of employee, exempt employee and non-exempt employee. But honestly, there's nothing different about them for the most part. Um, so to have an extra class to do that is probably not that important. So we have a pattern for that. And let's take another example of tagging things. Let's say you want to tag works of art or books or anything really. Um, so you might say, here's a photograph of a blizzard, and this is categorized by the concept of winter. Or maybe there's a book called Winter of Our Discontent, um, and that's also categorized by winter. So you can think of one use of a category is to think of it as a tag. The most pervasive use of categories in our work with ontology with enterprises is things like you know drop down menus for put for statuses so maybe you have a process that's an ongoing event that happens on a regular basis what's the status this process hasn't started yet it's in mid in mid strike um, it's completed so these would be statuses and you could model you could create a process status as a subclass of just category and then you'd have three instances which are those with the, are those actual tags. So this is three different ways of looking at buckets, and we have um, policies for how to do that. So here's just a summary of the difference. So a different kind of a bucket. You can have an individual of a, t of a kind of a thing, and you would model that as a class. Typically, that's how that's our general convention. And you put things into the bucket using RDF type, or you can have a bucket which contains kind of things that are functionally connected in some way. So in the case we use the jury, we have the bucket itself is represented as an instance of the subclass of collection, and we put things into the bucket using the is member of property. Um, the bucket containing all the items within a particular tag is another way of thinking about bucket. Or maybe if, if you have, you know, events and you want to track the status of the event, you might say a bucket containing all the events whose status is complete, right? Or a particular tag, things like that. So this is kind of like a view of different ways to put things into buckets. So let's just look at each one a little bit more closely. So when would you create a collection? Well, um, if it's if things are, are functionally connected in some way, as in the case of a jury, or a deck of cards or a committee. Now, a deck of cards is a bit of an artificial example. You probably wouldn't 
wouldn't create a collection to that, but it is an example of things that are functionally connected. And you might conceivably do that if you were modeling some kind of card game stuff. Um, and then you use just is member of or has member to populate the collections. Now we do have ordered collections. So where things are in a very specific order, there's two ways that you can indicate order. One is what you call in computing a linked list. So you basically say, so however many objects you have in your collection, you say this one precedes, directly precedes, or directly follows this other one. And once you have everything linked together that way, now you have an ordered collection. Another way to specify the order is to say, well, let's say we have three things in there. We just want to say, this is the first one, this is the second one, this is the third one. And so you have a data type property called just sequence whose values are integers, one, two, and three. Now there's reasons for choosing one or the other of these. If you want to, if things are gonna be fixed and never changed, not, you're not gonna add new members or take them away or reorder things, then sequence is probably easiest to do. But if you wanna have the flexibility of moving things around or adding new things, the precedes and follows links. If you have a list of seven things and you have seven, six links connecting the different things, and then you insert something, it's pretty easy. You just leave most of the connections stay the same. You just add something. But if you have sequence and you have seven things and then you add something in the middle, then you have to change the sequence number for the rest of them. So that's a consideration for which of these two options you would choose. And we use has ordered member instead of has member to populate the ordered collections. Hey, Mike, Michael, you got time for an interruption? Absolutely. Uh, one other thought on when to use collections is uh, heterogeneity. So oh. if the things are not of the same type, but you want to put them in a collection, like an art collection, you might have paintings and sculptors and rugs and crap. You know, you would never think, oh, let's make a class because they aren't really of the same type. They're not even categorized the same. It's just a arbitrary collection. Yeah, that's a good that's a good example. Thank you, Dave. I like that. Um, and then you would put them in together because they were for, for some reason you think about them in, in a useful way and you as a grouping. So it's a generic grouping collection. But yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, here's something. So one individual can be in more than one order collection. So you might have, you know, the, the collection of people, the connection of football teams who who are number one. And that's a bad example. Let's say an individual who's the best tennis player. Maybe they're a number one ranked tennis player, but they're only number two ranked in table tennis, say. So you can have one individual that's in more than one order collection in a different position. So I'm going to skip over this detail of how we model it. Um, so let's look at categories. In business, categories are extremely important. They, there's lots of different kinds from simple enumerated lists where you maybe have a status, you know, not started yet, in process, complete, abandoned, etc. So that's very often we just have simple flat enumerated lists. It's kind of like a simple taxonomy. You normally think of a taxonomy as a hierarchy of things, but that's the a flat taxonomy, which has just one level. It's just a simple enumerated list. So we'll use those for creating categories. And but also you have multi-level hierarchies. We often have hierarchies of of um, different things, like product taxonomy is the most common example. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Um, you can also use uh, the example we talked about tags for indexing. We don't see that all that often in enterprise applications, but we would if we did some content management stuff. Well, so here's what about I have a question about, about collections. What about intrinsically ordered collections? Well, then you would have you know, like, go ahead. A library is a you know is is a is a collection of books ordered by its Dewey Decimal Number or Library of Congress number. Oh, that's interesting. Well, if, well, that's interesting. Huh? You could. Well, that's fascinating. I guess you'd have to have a reason for ordering them. So, if you have every single book in there and you have a link. You have a property on each book which points to that number, then that is a, that is a de facto ordering. Um, I guess you'd have to ask the question, why is the, what would you want? What would be gained by have, calling it an ordered collection? I guess it is an ordered collection, but I'm not sure that it would be a benefit in using that. That's an interesting question. 
I'm not sure that's an ordered collection, even though the numbers are ordered. I think it's a, it's a set of subcategories. Well, that that's is a, a good... set of subcategories, but it's also the case that they're that if you want to find the book on the shelf, you know, you've got to you've got to uh, you do that by the fact that the that the uh, numbers are ordered. Actually, that's an interesting question. Well, so you could have another property on there. Which I mean, they didn't have to be. They didn't you have to still be still find them if they're out of order, just labeled well. <laughs> if you look yeah. at the, um, uh, if you, uh, um, what is it? Uh, uh, Cotton Vitellius nine, the, the manuscript for um, for Beowulf. I think it's nine. Might be a different number. Anyway, that that tells you on what on what bookcase and on what shelf it is. And how far it is from the left end of the shelf. Just to it years, have, it's not a, there it's is not a folio a, shelf. I don't know if that affects the. That's a bit. Let me make a. Let me make a comment. Yeah. If you have something like a bunch of books, and each book points to, uh, has a property which is some numbering, then that constitutes de facto an ordered collection. But you might have another property which points to, say, the number of total number of copies sold. Now you might say, oh, that's another ordered list. So actually that is, in both cases, there are different orderings. So you could create them as overt ordered lists if you if you had a need to. So that, I would say they're implicitly ordered lists sitting there, but not explicitly. So go ahead, Rebecca. Well, but they can be located differently in different libraries. So one uh, library might have the 100s and then the 600s and then the 900s, and they're not then in numerical order. Um, right. So, so I don't think you can say the numbering in the De Dewey Decimal System is uh, provides location. Uh, it, it provides a categorization, and uh, libraries can choose to order that uh, physically in the way that they want to. I can see that that they those those are bad examples. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I think that's there are. Question, I think got another. I think the got another hand up. Examples. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> another hand up, uh, Michael Sullivan. Yeah, after working on dozens of projects, um, basically, if if, a, if something is ordered and it never changes, this is fine. Um, you know, like a like the chapters in a book, right? That they're never going to change. So you can have one, two, three, all of that's good. But I've worked on so many projects where the, the that's not the standard. The standard is that the ordering is always constantly changing. And right. I'm now against modeling anything where the order's in, modeled in the database itself. Rather, mm. at, query, at query time, mm -hmm. some sort of process, whether it's through materialization or inferencing or whatever, creates the order in an ad hoc uh, manner. And I wish I wish Sparkle had something nice like this, but it doesn't. So you know, it's, it's somewhat of a quandary. But I'm now, after 20 years of doing this stuff, I, I, unless it never changes, something like a book, uh, I, I try to tell my clients do not uh, model the order, even though the and the front end people need the order. Um, don't model it in the back end. Uh, um, figure out some sort of in between thing. Yeah, a classic one would be Michael's favorite movies, right? You know, or, you know, <laughs> movies. That's going to change every day, every week, and may change by context, right? I might, I might belong to a, you know, a sci-fi group, and my favorite movies there are completely different than, you know, a, a whatever. So, right. I'm just, yeah. yeah, I'm just against the ordering, ex with, with the one exception of when it never changes. I, I don't agree. I think. Um... I don't agree that volatile data should not be modeled. Um, so just because it changes, I mean, your name can change. Other, lots of things can change. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't model it. Furthermore, the the book club example is just two different collections. You know, you're, it's not Michael's favorite books. It's Michael's favorite books in the sci-fi book club or whatever. It, you just have to choose the appropriate collection, but I think ordering collections, uh, modeling ordering is very important in many contexts. Does anyone have, I have 
just one example of using, I haven't used ordered collection very often in the work over the years at Semantic Arts, but one case I did use it was for representing templates of books. In other words, one, one organization, they a lot of their business involves writing reports and the report types are, are each has a template. So report type number one might have four different parts and they're in a very specific order. You know, introduction, conclusion, you know, summary, outline, whatever. But you might have the same kind of content in another simpler report would only use this three parts, but the same part is reused. And for one of the templates, it's it's the third part, but in the other template, it's only the second part because it's a simpler template, but you can reuse parts of the organization. But I haven't seen that used all that often. But I think I want to move on unless someone else has another comment. Mr. Wallace, I was just going to quickly say uh, I we've hmm. used it for process, essentially process templates, right? When you're saying uh, when you're actually going to model a process, it is important the order that you do things. Um, right, that's a good example. That yeah, you, uh, you. you take the eggs out of the shell before you cook them or not. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> so that's one's case, and I think uh, yeah, that's, thank you, Mark. But it could be a task template, though. <laughs> but I, I think right. yeah, but there's still stuff, still an ordered collection of things. The existing stuff uh, handles so that it. handles that well. I mean, that, sure that is indeed I sequence. Got your message from yesterday. Uh, Mr. Campbell with the stand up. Oh, I was just going to say the same thing, which is I see ordered collections in my work at Allotrope where you're talking about, say, a bunch of runs on some piece of hardware when there's a tray of samples put on and each one of those samples is processed in a different way. So it's kind of a process template as well. Mm -hmm. Somebody's talking in the background. Can you please mute? Becca is mm -hmm. right Yep, then Rebecca. Yeah. Um Sorry, I'm putting my hand up so many times, but I've used ordered collections for ranking of occupations, like uh -huh. admin associate one, admin associate two, et cetera. I've also used it for um, incarnations, which are oh. in nature. <laughs> so like like the Dalai Lama, his yeah. fourth incarnation, his 72nd incarnation. incarnation. 14, 15, et cetera. Excellent. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. So we do and, have. And I, I know you want to move on, Michael, but um, as you start this taxonomy thing, I just put a thing in the chat. I don't know if. Eric... Just lost your voice, Dave. Does everybody else lose his voice? Or no, I did, yeah. yeah. It just spontaneously. Um, I was going to say, as you start into the taxonomy thing, if everyone hasn't seen Katarina's uh three level thing why that why why ikea uses categories like this it's a great article i just put it in the chat oh well, thank I you see dave. it in the chat dave um for some reason can you just make sure it went in there there it is. Is. there got it, it is. now got it now thanks dave Okay, well, you know, if we don't finish, we always have part four mm -hmm. as a possibility. <laughs> the penultimate. Right. This will be the yeah, exactly, oh. exactly. All right, so now we're going to look at a very important thing that shows up time and time again over the years uh, in, in enterprise, in enterprise knowledge graph and ontology work that we do. So there's a real distinction between the thing that you can buy, you walk into the store and you buy one, versus the category of things that you can buy. Now, you can't actually walk into the Apple store and say, I want an iPhone SE 2020. And then they'll write up a receipt for you and you pay the money because they'll say, oh, that's not specific enough. I need to know the color and I need to know the gigabytes of RAM you want in there. And so once it's specific enough that you can actually buy one, then it kind of crosses over this, this ontological abyss, if you like. Um, where now I can actually buy one that has a model number and it also has a uh, uh, serial number because it's an actual individual thing, right? But that individual thing is in a category. It's in a broader category of iPhone SE 2020, which comes in several different colors and several different gigs of RAM configurations. But this is now in a product taxonomy because there's different higher level categories. There's iPhone itself of which there are other subcategories, iPhone 13 series, iPhone X series. But then iPhone is really has, is just one of a, a broader category of smartphones, which includes Android smartphones and we used to have Windows smartphones. So these are all categories, right? And so 
we have a class called category in gist and we create a subclass the way the pattern works for just categories you create a subclass of just category to put instances of the categories you care about in it so in this case if you're interested in product categories you create a class called product category. this may already be in gist i'm not sure if we have product category or not but i've created it many times if we don't have it and so then this is an instance of product category but every one of these other things is also a direct instance of product category okay so that's how to think about product taxonomies and again this this shows up frequently and um there's one problem that you have with all it's a limitation of all whereas on the one hand this is an instance of product category it also has instances because there are different phones that are instances of this, but you can't have two levels of instance in all. It's just a limitation of the. In this example, I wrote up in one of the chapters in my book. If that limitation is interesting for you, you can have a look. OK. Now, here's an interesting thing that we see more and more with our client work. Um, they come in, and they love Semaphore, and Semaphore is a great tool for, for modeling taxonomies and thesauri in SCOS. But we have our way of modeling concepts and categories, and it's we looked at it once and thought, well, gosh, these are almost the exact same thing. So in actual fact, they're very close, and you can you can kind of map back and forth between them. So one of the things we found is some of our clients they already have been modeling out their taxonomies in Semaphore or some other tool, um, and in taxonomy in GIST could be represented as a SCOS concept scheme. That's kind of the punchline. So that's, that's how you would think about mapping it. So in that case, if you had a taxonomy of product categories like here, you could put this in SCOS. In fact, each one of these then would be an instance of SCOS concept uh, as well as an instance of product category. So the gist way of doing things, it's an instance of product category. The SCOS way of doing things is to say it's an instance of SCOS concept. And SCOS concept, that particular SCOS concept belongs in what's called the SCOS concept scheme. Okay, so there's a nice little mapping between that. And some of the client work we've done, we actually export these things and change the concept scheme to the corresponding just category. Um, now, just also has something called controlled vocabulary and taxonomy. So, in effect, we have two different ways to do what's basically the same exact thing. It just so happens that SCOS wasn't around when Dave created these elements in just many years ago. Uh, but it's important to note that there, there's a cross correlation here and you can make you can map back and forth if you need to. Doug Beeson's got his hand up. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, thanks. I, I wanted to uh, just actually <laughs> ask my colleagues and anyone else present. I, I, I'm, I'm facing an issue, if you go to the previous slide, at Amgen, uh, oops, Brian, I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, one? which one? Uh, where I've got stuff that's in categories and, and, I, and I originally modeled it using SCOS and then I thought, well, maybe I don't need SCOS if, I need, if I've got GIST and, but you just kind of said that it's actually okay, like to have using both SCOS and 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 just category is there an advantage or disadvantage to using both does anybody have any advice for me <laughs> well here's the comment oh go ahead so that others comment first uh, I'll have my hands up i don't want to get in front of someone but um yeah so it's interesting we've talked about this a little bit with clients and it's a bit of a sticky subject but um a lot of times uh, clients have done an awful lot of work in taxonomies uh, you know they have all these taxonomies sometimes thousands of items in them uh, but the sticky part is they're not always super nice. They're not always super rigorous. They're not the same way we would do it. So, um, uh, and and there's so we take that into account. So I would say in my practice, I have been putting those always in a, a SCOS concept scheme. I give it a name. I put all their stuff in there. And in a sense, it and this is the the sensitive thing. But you know, it just doesn't. It, I don't want to use the word pollute, but it, it doesn't uh, need to find its way into the ontology, which we're also maintaining. And the ontology, we're kind of being a lot more rigorous. So the other thing is, again, I don't know that I'd want to put uh, thousands of instances of ca of a certain category in the ontology file itself. You know, it just kind of gets unwieldy. To me, it's very modular. And when I put that stuff in a concept scheme, I find that also mentally, it really buckets it for me. And it says, this is an informal taxonomy. And what I like about it, 
is I can still categorize anything, any instance of the formal ontology by any number of categories in what I'm calling these informal taxonomies. It's, which you means you kind of wall it off. You it's like a, it's a, yeah, it's it's like a different swim lane, but it's it's still it's modeled in SCO, so it's modeled in OWL still. So it makes it very easy to interoperate with them, but it keeps a very clean wall of separation between those which we're not in control of, and they may change a lot, and they may not be very rigorous. We don't want to break reasoning, and the the pure ontology part. Okay, that's that's what we're doing. Yeah. Thanks. Is there anyone else with the hand up? Because I can't see that. Uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, yeah. Um, so I want to, Mark, I wanted to ask you, um, I typically don't use a concept scheme. Um, I just use the category and make things, um, uh, the categories, uh, sorry, um, the individual categories, uh, sorry, the individual, I guess you would say taxonomic elements are, yeah. are members of a category. Uh, or types of a category. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trouble. So, so I don't use the class concept scheme. Um, it seems to me those are two different but equivalent um, methods of achieving the same thing. Yeah, and, and I've done this over time. Like at first we just said, okay, well, we'll create a category, a subclass of category, like Michael mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, in the ontology, even if we create the instances by some other automation and just say they're of that type, right? We don't have to have every instance in the ontology. But after a while, um, it just started seeming like we had so many of those that it was easy enough to just say, we stopped wanting to, every time we change something there to, to make an ontology change when it's really just another scheme that people want to use. And that's, so part of it was the kind of that modularity level. Uh -huh. And I will also admit that as we were transitioning to this and feeling our way through it, we have a few concepts that we kind of did both. We said this is a SCOS concept and a category whatever. And more recently, as we've had even more of these things in this kind of uh, other swim lane, we've gotten to where we're not even making using the category at all. We're just saying, look, it's a concept scheme and you can refer to anything in a concept scheme all you want. The, the one thing this does, though, I, I'd say is, you know, the one impact maybe is what, when you're not using category is you do have to realize that your queries might be slightly different. Instead of saying I'm looking for you know some value that is uh, right categorized by this value, which is a member of product category or whatever my thing is, I have to start saying this is categorized by something that is a in scheme so and so. You know what I mean? So it just slightly changes mm -hmm. the way you figure out what kind of thing it is or what what bucket it lands in. Um, well, it's yeah. just category. It's a subclass. Uh, Oops. I mean, not formally, but um, conceptually as a subclass of SCOS concept, would you say? Conceptually, it probably, yeah. I, I'd say it's probably a subclass of SCOS concepts. So, SCOS concepts kind of fuzzy, but but yeah. I don't think we assert that anywhere. I don't think we assert no, no, any no. association anywhere in gist between the two, but to me, no. they're, they're both used by categorized by. That's kind of the convention. Right. Right. Adam had his hand up, but he no longer does. So Dave now has his hand up. <laughs> Adam, did you, did yeah. you sure you don't want to say anything? Okay. The one the one thing I was going to say, SCOS bro broader and just subcategory of are very similar, but they're not identical. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, how the do you see the difference? Yeah, mm -hmm. the distinction is, uh, and it says it in the in the annotations. I'm pretty sure that uh, just sub subcategory of um, is used where anything categorized this by this would be a subclass of that thing if you made a class out of it. In other words, okay. it's, a, it's a formal. Whereas, whereas broader, just literally broader means indented list. So anytime oh. you have camera, lens, camera cloth, people will sometimes say that's broader. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. And you would never say that a lens class is the camp, you know. So it's it's trying to make that distinction. Yeah. So and just keep that in mind. And and especially like when Mark says when you import a lot of informal ontologies, half the time that's what they're doing because anybody who can create an indented list, which is to say anybody, um, will eventually do that. Right. That's and so actually, you're right. We only use broader in those uh, informal ontologies or taxonomies. We only use the SCOS terms because we don't want to imply any yeah. more uh, semantic yeah. meaning than that. 
Yes, thank you, Dave. That's something I hadn't even realized. That's no. great. Yeah. All right. So this is good. Maybe this well, whole session is going to be, if, in. you know, if. Wait. Ahead, so John. this means that if you know the, uh, there's an entry George in an index and underneath it says and Michael, that that is what's that broader or narrower? It certainly doesn't sound narrower. Wait, say that again. I didn't catch the drift. I got lost at where where it was said that, you know, indentation is what broader and narrower we're supposed to represent. Oh, well, it's probably. not so much that they're supposed to, but if you look at a lot of so-called taxonomies and you start asking yourself, what does the indent mean here? Man, it, it doesn't always mean formal subclass. No. Right, and I was saying that an example of that is, you know, the... Uh, George the fifth, you know, might be an entry in an index, but then if it says under that, you know, George the fifth and so and so, which is which is commonplace in indexes, then clearly that is not a mm. narrowing of George right. the fifth. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Gonna go back. Any other hands up? I don't see any, but maybe. Okay. Good. Good. Cool. Nope. Looks good. All right, so that's that point. So now let's have a peek at some. Of, it turns out that subclasses of just category are very much pervasive in our enterprise ontologies. But even in just itself, we have a, probably more subclasses under just category than any other um, class. So we just a few of the things. Aspect is this is when you kind of have to reify. You know, the as you might have a property called has weight. Um, but if you need to talk about the weight of a, something that you haven't bought yet, it's not the weight of an actual thing, then you might have to create an aspect of something and have that be instantiated as a property. Um, behaviors are things that characterize events. So what is this event? Oh, this event is a, is a create event of some sort like that. Controller types. Dave, I forget what. Does anybody remember what controller type is? That's not something that we use very often. This is part uh, of some. I, I think that was part of the IoT stuff, if I remember uh, right. Okay, yeah. Degree of equipment, types of equipment. I'm not going to go through every one of these, uh, but there's just a bunch of. And we do actually have just tagged, it turns out, for a certain kind of tag. Although it hasn't been used an awful lot in my oh, experience. Right. Uh, and then collection. The, the two, two important. I mentioned this in passing, but just to show you how they show up in just itself. Collections of terms, right? But controlled vocabulary is a collection of terms. Taxonomy is a particular type where the link where the linkages are, as Dave said, direct supercategory or direct subcategory. Okay, now this is a whole major section, so we're going to run through it and we'll see where we get to. Quantities, units, and measures. It's something that shows up time and again in lots of different um, enterprise ontologies. So just a quick run through. So what do we mean by quantities, units, and measures? So well, things like 82 kilograms, three meters, or 20 minutes, and you can model that, right? So what we call that a just magnitude in, in just. <clears throat> so it's kind of, I think of it as just kind of some amount of something, 20 minutes, three meters, 82 kilograms. So there's a, two pieces. There's a number and there's a unit of measure, and it's pretty much that simple, but we see how it gets more complex when we want to do interesting things like, Anyway, so then this unit of measure it turns out that I'm not going to get into this, but these these days they're grounded in the physical world. It used to be a meter was a physical thing that was kept at a certain humidity and a certain temperature in um, Paris somewhere, but now it's it's measured in how far light travels in some crazy decimal point number of seconds. So what about in the enterprise? That's what we really care about. So you know, if you're making shampoo, we worked with companies that produce shampoos. You know, there's different properties, density, acidity, percent concentration of aloe. So you might be testing, doing, you know, um, quality testing. And so you just pull a bottle of shampoo off the assembly line and you actually measure its acidity and its density. So now you have an actual density and actual acidity and it's measuring a very particular thing that exists. Right. Um, but you might also be specifying, hey, this shampoo has to have an acidity that's within this narrow range of 0.3 somethings to 0.5 somethings. Um, so the power products, we've done work with 
power product companies, the different characteristics, color, size, voltage, current. Each one of these has a unit, potentially. Some like things like color, not you have units, but size, voltage, current, those are units. Crude oil, laptops, color. So these different things, recurrent events. How often does something happen that, that arises frequently? Real estate. Acres, dimensions, square feet. So there's an important distinction, as I hinted at a moment ago, between describing what actually is measured, like the density of some aloe that comes off the assembly line, versus what should be, right? So particular batch versus the formula that's supposed to produce something or a sample coming off the production line. Um, what's in a particular tanker? So in other words, we just got a shipment of Brent crude from somewhere. Um, and it's one thing to say, well, let's take a sample and measure its actual sulfur content versus what it's supposed to be, which is a defined grade. Uh, so this is other examples. Um, here's an example in real estate. So there's the ac acreage of your particular lot. So where you live in your nice little residential area in the suburbs of somewhere, um, there's an actual, you know, maybe there's a given listing that it has 0.35 acres. But what you want if you're going to buy a house is something between a quarter and a half an acre or maybe the amount of living space so the listing says that's 1700 square feet but you say you know i'm happy to have anything between 1500 and 2000 square feet so there's an important difference between what you want it's kind of specifying a range of what you regard as acceptable versus the, an actual measurement but the thing that the reason i'm talking about the distinction is because in both cases you're still representing just magnitude. So you can say 1,700 square feet, and that's a just magnitude. 1,500 square feet is also just magnitude, but its meaning and its usage is very different. In one case, it's an actual measurement of something. In another case, it's specifying what you want, but the, it's still a just magnitude. That's what binds these two things together. So we've had pervasive use of both of these over the years. So how do we do this in action in just itself? Well, we have a just magnitude. So here's an instance of a just magnitude, which means 82 kilograms. And it has two things, unit of measure, which is kilogram, and it has a decimal value. Now, we've this is old slide, so it's, it's currently we expanded out the wording, so it now has unit of measure instead of the shorthand UOM. We've also realized that there could be a, someone might decide not to use decimal value, which has a very specific data type meaning and XSD. So we've changed this to numeric value, to, so you have an option to use different things if you want to. Um, and so what is a magnitude? A magnitude, it's a quantity that can be expressed as a combination of a number and a unit. It has unit of measure and decimal value. And then these are definitions of those properties, right? So here's the other example. Three meters has unit of measure meter, has the number is three and 20 minutes. Okay, now conversions are quite important when we're talking about units and measures and quantities. So if you're dealing in extremely large numbers of something or extremely small numbers of something uh, or extremely small quantities, then it's convenient to have different um, units measured. For instance, if you're measuring bytes, you know, if you're measuring how many gigabytes your computer storage should be, you don't want to have measured it in bytes, because then you can have zeros everywhere. So that's just a convenience factor. Um, but also you may want to convert between different systems of measurement. We most of, we've never really had to do that in our work. Most of people just pick one and stick with it. Um, but if you do need a base unit to, to convert everything into, so those are the standard units where the conversion factor is one. So for example, just meter is an instance of unit of measure. It has itself, as a base unit. So whereas if it was kilometer, it would the, the unit of it's still a unit of measure, but kilometer would have meter as its base unit. But meter has itself as a space unit. And it also has number one as its conversion, because there is no con convert self to self, it's just multiplied by one as the identity multiplier. Whereas minute has a conversion of 60 so its base unit is second and this is just the system system international base units there's a specific name for that Dave, what do you call those again i i call them base units but i don't know oh they're just base units. Yeah, some yeah. formal name anyway yeah thanks. there is a formal name yeah 
And so then you convert to base and that number again is 60 because there's 60 seconds in a minute. Um, so again, we have unit of measure modeled out and it has its standard unit and base unit is one kind of standard unit. Standard unit would be things for like miles or distance, meters per second would be a standard unit for speed or meters per second squared would be a standard unit for um, acceleration. Okay, so a unit of measure always has a standard unit and that standard unit might be uh, something like meters per second or it might be a, a base unit itself, which is the things from which you construct things. And then you have a convert to the standard unit itself. And now has base unit is just a special case of has standard unit when the space unit is standard unit. And convert to base is again a special case of convert to standard. So other examples, an hour has base unit second and convert to base 3600. A milligram has convert to base of 0. 0.00001, count the zeros, make sure I got it right. Um, and its base unit is kilogram. And centimeter again has base unit of meter and conversion of 0. 0.01. So now how do we do complex units like area, volume, acceleration? And we'll talk about a, one of my favorite um, units just because I never heard of such a thing before, kinematic viscosity. Anyway, so what about area? Area is distance times a distance, so a square meter. Volume is distance times an area, which is say, for example, cubic mile or cubic meter. Um, so how would you do that? And just we have a way to build these things up step by step. So you have square meter, it's meter times meter. So we have a multiplier and a multiplicand. If you remember your math bay from, from grammar school or whatever. Um, so they're both two things, meter and meter, and you multiply them together. The volume is a distance times an area. So we already have an area here, right? So we take that area, which is square mile, and then we use it and we multiply it times miles. So now we have cubic miles. So we can build these things up step by step if we ever need to understand things clearly about a given unit. Here's another one that I, we had. A, this showed up in, for one of our clients who estimates how much it costs to buy Brent crude oil and things like that. So one of the things that matters for crude oil is what's called kinematic viscosity. It's an area divided by duration. So if it's thick and gooey, it's not not much is going to go go flow through a pipe in a given time period. But if it's thin and not very viscous, then it's going to go quickly. So this, it's, the unit would be square. Let's say you have square millimeter per second, right? So here's a unit square millimeter per second. This is the unit that turns out to be convenient for general use in that industry. So it has a numerator of an area unit, which is square millimeter. It has a denominator, which is second, and it has a convert to standard, which is the this one millionth, I guess. So that's how that would work. And then you say, well, but what about this area unit? Well, area unit is itself square millimeter. It has it has millimeter as the multiplier and as the multiplicand. And again, it has a conversion of 0.001. Now, these numbers are related because this is the conversion for this one. This one has a conversion of one. You really combine the two conversions of the pieces and you get the third one. Okay, so that's all very nice. This is all set up to be able to do this. Um, and this is what it looks like in a graphical language that we used to do and what it shows up like in Protege. So what is kinematic viscosity unit? It's a unit for measuring the ratio or absolute dynamic viscosity density, blah, blah, blah. So it's a unit of measure. It has a standard unit of square meter per second, and it has a numerator of an area unit and a denominator of a duration unit. And this is what it looks like in Protege. Now, the area unit class, which is what we use to define this, so this, this is an area unit. So whenever you refer to something, you know, in principle, you should be defining it as well. So it's an area unit. An area unit has standard unit of square meter, and it has multiplier and multiplicand as distance unit. So how do we use these units to describe things in our enterprise? So let's say we have a particular living unit, and we're saying this actual thing has 123 square meters of living area. 
So we create an instance of the thing we're describing and then we create a property which tells you what you care about. So this has living area, square meters. Now this exact actual property might have another, this hot property in a different sense. This lot in, in your residential neighborhood, you might have another um, characteristic that you care about, which is the, the total space of the lot. So this would be, so living area is maybe 122 square meters, but the overall area of the lot, which would be a different, you know, predicate in, 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 in your triple would have another area which would be maybe 500 square meters okay so that's how this works you have the thing that you're describing and then you point to a magnitude that, that and you say what the relationship between the thing is and the magnitude you're describing or similarly crude oil in a particular tanker has a kinematic viscosity of 2.92 square millimeters per second so here's some quantity of crude oil and if we go back to one of our earlier overviews this would be an instance of just substance the actual stuff that you can't count it up and if you divide it up into pieces it's the same kind of thing so this has kinematic viscosity of this particular number so it has the unit this is 2.92 square millimeters per second so that's how this works so that's it as far as units and measure goes um we've got four minutes left so i'm going to finish up um the two simple classes and then I'm not sure what we're going to do about the rest of it but we'll mm -hmm. think of something so template is something we just tweak the wording this is not the latest wording but essentially hey, Michael, think of it as yeah i'm sorry to interrupt i just uh, no, you, and fine. you may have said this um i noticed you had some very specific properties in there like has kinematic uh, viscosity and stuff uh, maybe you already said this i presume those are just sub properties of has magnitude you could view them that way, yes. You might or might not, but okay. in principle, you probably should, yeah. Okay. That's, That's a good question, thank you, yeah. So what's a template? A template is used to make instances in its own image. So a cookie cutter is a template for making cookies, a form that you fill out, you know, to apply for your enhanced driver's license, it's a form. So it's got slots in it, and it's essentially a template for the Apple application for the actual application that you send off to your local department of, lo of motor vehicles. Or, and we did this for one of our clients who was did a lot of manufacturing and stuff. So the die you make to pump out a, a part for a car, or maybe a sea kayak, or any number of other things, that's a template that's used to make things that are in its own image. So that's something that shows up from time to time in a modeling. Haven't used a lot. Anyone out there have, have some nice examples of using templates? I've used them I'm, for I'm, documents, but I haven't used it a lot over the years. I'm starting to use it a lot now in the gist accounting stuff I'm doing. Oh. It's the way to get from business events to their transactions and stuff that they run through. Right. Got a hand up from uh, John too. Anything okay. that's a prototype probably fits in here. Yep. You know, that's probably true. Yeah. Well, yeah. do we make a distinction between where you're actually making a copy of the thing or where the thing, you know, operates on something? You know, like if, if, if the template is a cookie cutter, the product is not a cookie cutter. But if the right. template's that's a true. form, then the product is a form. Yeah, well, so a, is, a prototype is different. Well, than a, that, that's tooling. an interesting question. I've modeled this before. I, it is a filled out form, which I would say is different than a form. But, but you're right. I mean, it's it's a bit of a nuance. Right. I mean, there's I, the I, prototype I, versus the tooling. Yeah, I would See? say I would say a copy is just a very degenerate form of templating. <laughs> I like that. With no, right. no translation at all. The, the, so thing I wanted to, the thing I wanted to bring up before I bet, have my hand up for a bit is um, measurements have tolerances or accuracies. Are we yes. modeling that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. In fact, that's one of the things we did for our product, for our electrical products. They had, two, so we said the target rated voltage is 500 volts, but we can have a tolerance of plus or minus 10 volts. Or you right. can have a tolerance of plus or minus 1%. Yeah, that's a manufacturing true. tolerance, but there's also tolerance yeah. of measurement. You know, yeah. you measure something yeah. as. Oh, that's long. a different one. Yeah, no, okay. different yeah, we have the same. We, sorry, we have a property called precision for that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 
that's something that I haven't used over the years. But we are we are out of time, and I just want to respect everyone's time. Um, so there's one more class which I already spoke to briefly, so there's not a lot more to say about it. Uh, but what's left? So what's left is to discuss common use properties. So what I propose is the following: we have another session which finishes this, and there's not a whole lot more to say, but there is another piece of useful stuff that I'm going to volunteer Phil Blackwood for doing. Phil has been identifying just patterns, and maybe we'll show that, but there's not 100% certain what we'll do next time. Um, but this is what remains, just like a bunch of properties that we could, I could take five or 10 minutes to speak to this, but. If, 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 yeah, you, looks if, good. You, man, if you manage to get Phil to, to do this, the other thing he was working on, we're trying to digest what you can learn from QUDT, which is another unit of measure thing, which has the advantage of having many, many more actual conversion values than we do. Yes. It yes. has the disadvantage of being 10x more complicated than it needs to be. So yeah. we were trying to reduce some of that complexity down and then try and reuse their conversion factors. So he yeah, may want to speak to that. One of the things that Phil Phil did a lot of analysis on units you know, of measure and gave some good input. One of the key things that he made me realize was all this nice way of modeling things out in grand and glorious detail. It was nice and you could explain to the client, look, we have all the semantics of what this unit means measured out, but it turns out we never used it. And so what Dave is hinting at is, you know, you could just go from kinematic viscosity unit and just say, here's my conversion standard. And you, even though this is true, Modeling it out turns out not to have ever been useful. So one of the things we're going to document is if you just want these units and you know that just you can go to Google, honestly, and you can look up these conversion factors and just do that. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will wrap. Anybody have any final questions, comments before we close? Looks like as John has his hand up. And I just didn't take it down. Oh, and Adam, too, oh. it looks like. Adam, yeah. Adam, yeah. Yeah, hey. I just wanted to jump on that comment, Dave, that you made about QUDT because so often in these other unit ontologies, everything's a class in that world, you know, where everything can't be used in the way that I think just wants to use it. Maybe just even some simple alignments to QUDT could mm -hmm. get all of that backing semantics in place without having people understand about system international and quantity kinds and a thousand other things there. So that would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's that's. Phil did some great work on that. We just haven't incorporated it yet, but yeah, one, absolutely. One thing that's entirely possible, maybe that maybe this is what Phil did, but I also read a paper about somebody else doing this type of thing. You can, because all those thousands of units are in Turtle, sorry, they're in um, RDF, we can write construct, we can load them into a triple store, write construct queries and just map them to whatever it would correspond to in GIST, and that should be relatively straightforward. Yeah, I bet their abbreviations would would link yeah. up really, really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of it, it there's there's some weirdness. It's it's in in theory pretty straightforward, but there's some. There's some <laughs> yeah, no there. doubt there always yeah. is. Now, Adam, you spoke already. Is anyone who has a hand up still that needs something to say? Okay, well, thank you everyone for another yeah. good session. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. That was awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye.